Welcome to season two of the Project Hope podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer. As many of you know, I am a cult survivor myself. For anyone interested, you can hear the story of how I got in and how I got out in season one, episodes one and two. The beginning of this year, 2023, actually marks my 11 years of being out, and I am so super grateful for the ways my life has unfolded since. I now work with survivors of coercive control, and I'm going to take a moment here to define this term as one of my heart's desires is to help society at large better understand coercive control in cases that are not just culty, but across the globe I view coercive control as a social issue. It's at the heart of cases where women and girls are murdered. We find coercive control in one-to-one relationships that are intimate, in gangs, sex trafficking, and cults of all types. I have a master's in the psychology of coercive control, and I'm just beginning a new element of my career as an expert witness for legal cases that involve coercive control. As a certified trauma professional, I work with survivors. I'm especially excited to be offering a group survivor program for cult and religious abuse recovery. So this is not a support group, but rather a healing program. It's based on my certification in the incredible work of Dr. Jilly Jenkinson, who gathered decades of research on survivors to create a body of work that I would consider to be the most comprehensive and flexible approach I've come across in this field. We will meet every other week for six months, and registration will open in February of 2023 for those interested. Lastly, I am also a research associate at Salford University and explore topics related to coercive control. So let's jump back into a basic understanding of coercive control before I introduce the next episode. Coercive control is a strategic pattern of behavior designed to exploit, control, create dependency, and dominate. The victim's everyday existence is micromanaged and their space for action, as well as potential as a human being, is limited and controlled by the abuser. Initially, the victim may be drawn into the relationship with love bombing and charm. Then gaslighting, isolation, economic control, and financial abuse can take place alongside rules and regulations that are gradually introduced over time and change at the whim of the abuser. The victim knows there are consequences if rules are broken and they apply to the victim rather than the perpetrator, creating a double standard. Over time, coercively controlling behavior erodes the victim's sense of self, their confidence, self-esteem, agency, and autonomy. The abuser creates an unreal world of contradiction, confusion, and fear. It may be helpful to know that 51% of victims do not even know that they are being abused, manipulated, and controlled. Coercive control correlates significantly to serious harm, and in many cases, in intimate partner violence, it precedes homicide. These can be difficult topics to grapple with, so I truly hope that this podcast helps to protect you and those you love with helpful voices and information. If you appreciate the podcast, Please let us know by subscribing and comment with kindness. And always think critically, trust your intuition, and be free. I want to welcome everyone back to part two of the two-part episode with Erica Bornman. 
And I will set this episode up by providing you all with her bio again, and then go into some details and expectations around the episode itself. So when Erica Bornman was nine years old, her family joined and ultimately moved to Kwasi Zabantu, a Christian mission in South Africa, a place touted as a multiracial nirvana founded on egalitarian values. But life at Kwasi Zabantu was hard, especially because Christianity was used to justify harsh punishments and physical abuse. Kwasi Zabantu exerted emotional, psychological, and sexual control over her, until finally she escaped at the age of 21. Escaping a restrictive religious community is difficult, but rehabilitation into normal life after a decade of ritual humiliation, brainwashing, and abuse was much more painful. Erica could not ignore her knowledge of the grievous human rights abuses being committed at Kwesiza Bantu, and so she embarked on a quest to expose the atrocities. With her help, News 24 launched a seven-month investigation, culminating in a podcast that would go on to win the internationally renowned One World Media Award for radio and podcast in 2021. In Mission of Malice, My Exodus from Kwasiza Bantu, Erica chronicles her journey from a fearful young girl to a fierce activist determined to do whatever it takes to save future generations and find personal redemption and self-acceptance. Erica has also carved a career for herself in magazine publishing as a writer and editor. Mission of Malice, her memoir, is her first book and an important element in her quest to make the world a safer place for children. She lives in Cape Town, South Africa with her two cats. So if you haven't listened to part one of the Project Hope podcast with Erica, you may want to do that now. To refresh your memories, we just came off of a conversation about Erica's relationship with family. We heard the clip from her mother and her heartbreaking sentiments about her sister and nieces who are still at Kwasiza Bantu. As we enter into this portion of our discussion, we have just been acknowledging how hard it is for Erica to know that her nieces are there, but also her concern for all the children that have known no life other than within Kwasiza Bantu. In this next section of our discussion, you will hear what I say to Erica in response to what she's just shared. As I'm speaking, Erica begins to experience neurogenic tremors which is a PTSD response to the subject matter and the flooding of stress hormones in our system. You will hear Erica share this with me, and I quickly pause the recording so we can breathe and be together. Erica actually requested that we go back online, and you will hear her considerations behind this. So just wanted to provide a little heads up for the audience on that as you proceed, And although all episodes of this podcast come with a trigger warning, please do take care as you listen. In this episode, you will also hear about Erica's experience as a whistleblower and some at least of what her experience has been. During a conversation that Erica and I had after our interview, we discussed possibly coming back on to be with you all and discuss the moment we paused in the interview. In retrospect, when I listened to our interview, I realized we did speak about it, but I also thought that the recording that took place here months later might be helpful to some, so we did leave it in. And on that note, please enjoy. I assume is our perfect segue into this discussion that's more around the whistleblowing and this whole component, Erica, that is so unique to your story and dare I say your kind of path, you know, this life path where, you know, that you have decided really to take on 
revealing and exposing what is happening because it's still taking place and these abuses are still alive. I mean, uh, but it's also, it's so, you know, it's, it's such an interesting journey. I think, you know, as you and I have talked about where there's this, it's all so fresh and so close to the heart and yet it's there's kind of this inner drive if i i don't want to put words in your mouth but there's something some inner drive of just this must one must move forward with this because others are experiencing something that you've known you know yeah yeah jennifer i'm going to ask you if we can take a a short break um i i i don't know if you know about neurogenic tremors and that it's a it's a ptsd some um uh thing that happens where your body just starts shaking uncontrollably yeah. like, and, and, and i'm busy experiencing that right now so i just oh. need to take a minute or two and just just breathe it's very time. deeply and so here we go so i just pressed record again and erica and i just took a moment <laughs> kind of off screen, but we actually thought that we'd come back with this conversation because, well, firstly, Erica, I just want to say thank you so much. It's now it's making me emotional (laughs) of, I just so appreciate your rawness and your willingness to just be with me in the feelings and you know, just showing, as you said, that these discussions and that that certain areas, you know, are triggers and they bring up the feelings again. And as you said, it's like we can be so far along in the healing process and yet these things still come up and just allowing for that to be okay, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that, um, you know, I sometimes have people contact me and they say, you're so strong, Erica. And I hope that one day I'm going to be as strong as you. And, and yes, I am strong. And, and I think we as survivors, we are strong, but I also think it's important to, to show and to normalize that it's okay to break down and that that isn't a weakness i always used to think that my tears were a sign of weakness but they're not you know and i for example i i don't apologize when i start crying i might apologize for needing to stop the recording or apologize for um breaking the conversation or something but i don't apologize for tears i don't apologize for getting emotional and for crying and i i think it's important for people who who are new to this journey um that 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 you know it it it's okay it's okay to break down and cry when you talk about these things because they're not normal they're not, they shouldn't be normal and and i think there are parts of my story that i've told often enough now that i don't get emotional um when i when i speak about it but then there are parts of my story and that it is it 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 is painful to speak about every single time it it it's painful but i do it because i believe with every fiber of my being that if not me then who if i don't then who you know and i believe i i don't know whether there's an afterlife i don't I, I I think there is something bigger than just as humans, but um, if if there is a purpose in life, and if people come to this world with a purpose, then I believe that my purpose was to experience all that because either I or whoever knew that I was strong and brave and eloquent enough to speak and to and to speak about this and. But it hurts. Of course it hurts. You know, it's it's not it's not like someone can wave a magic wand and it just magically disappears and everything's suddenly okay. Um right. 
that doesn't happen. But am I the the difference though between now and in my twenties and thirties is that I can feel this pain, but it doesn't consume me. And I know that I am okay. And what I've learned in therapy, when it becomes so overwhelming, is to remember that this is a memory. Yeah. I'm safe now. The worst has already happened and I survived and I'm out. And yes, it still hurts. And yes, it's still painful, especially talking about my niece's hurt. But um, because it takes me right back to being that powerless young girl again. Um. But the worst has already happened. I survived. I'm safe now. And it's okay to feel whatever I feel. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. thank you for being so gracious about me breaking down there for a while. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Erica, it felt like an honor to be with you in that time that we just had, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So this reminds me of a moment in the book that I would... I'm happy to read it or you're welcome to read it. I, I don't know if I marked it or not, but Erica, I would love to read the part of your book where you talk about this. Um, it's kind of a metaphor around dancing with the feelings or the demons <laughs> or the... I'd love to hear the words. Wonderful. Um, I'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> this is... I, I really, this, um, it really hit me, this part. Okay, I'll start here. I was definitely luckier than some, but I was still harmed. I don't think anyone leaves there intact. And I feel for the people living there, the majority of whom are good people wanting to do good. The damage is pervasive. It is destructive and insidious. During our final podcast interview, Dion asked me how I found the whole process and what I've learned about myself. I mix an awful lot of metaphors as I paint him a picture many years ago. I put all my demons and skeletons in a box and I buried that box in a very, very deep hole. I had to in order to survive because I did not have the tools to deal with them. They didn't stay in that very box, of course. They managed to claw their way out and crawl through the soil. They left that box and started terrorizing me, these demons and skeletons. And the demons looked at me with red hot coals for eyes and the skeletons shook their bones around. For so many years, their visits petrified me because I couldn't deal with them. I didn't know how. I just wanted to run away from them, and I would beg them to please just get back in their box or find a cupboard or something and just leave me alone. And then I grew stronger. Now when a demon arrives, I look at it and say, okay, you're here. Let's chat. What have you got to teach me? Teach me, tell me, and then fuck off. And the demons have diminished in number. They teach me what they came to teach me, and then they disappear into thin air, or, I don't know, maybe become angels. Who knows what happens to them? The skeletons are a little bit trickier because they represent shame. When addressing them, I confront the shame I carry inside me. I haven't wanted people to know about certain things because if they know, they're going to judge, judge me. During the earlier podcast recordings, I had this vision of flinging open my cupboard doors and saying to those collections of bones, come out, let's dance. Who wants to waltz? Who wants to salsa? Let's dance. When I stop fearing them, they turn from scary to almost friendly, almost paternal and maternal, almost caring, if bony fingers can be caring. We dance, and I realize yet again that I can't salsa. They teach me some steps. I teach them a step or two, and then they disappear. Right now, 
There are still some skeletons left in my cupboard. I'll dance with them one day when I'm ready. And what is the important lesson I've learned about myself? That's simple. You might have to say the word, Erica. Garaka Chok, I am my den. <laughs> and you'll have to yes. read the book to find out the significance of that word. <laughs> yes, I love it. Garaka Chok. <laughs> I also yeah. feel really happy to get to have read that, Erica, because again, I think, you know, for the survivors, it's just one way, perhaps, to look at things. And I'd imagine that that metaphor might resonate very particularly with certain individuals. It certainly hit me. And I think it resonated for me around this idea that, again, everybody has a different kind of journey, but for me, really opening those gates and allowing the feelings to move when they want to move, that there's something about that dance, as you said, that it's like the feelings teach me in the process, or they have a voice, or they have something to share, to reveal, or to even kind of close, you know, in that process of just the feeling. And the needing to stop judging myself for the many stupid things I did while I was trying to find my place and while I was trying to heal, and to just give myself the same amount of grace that I extend to other people that was an important lesson for me to learn but but also to to understand that it's almost a process of of going back and taking that young eight-year-old girl and giving her a hug and saying I'm sorry I abandoned you for so long but I'm here now and I'm older and wiser and I'm gonna protect you and to just go back and 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 do that and and I genuinely don't know that I would have been able to do that without therapy um I have an incredibly wise therapist um who is definitely trauma informed and and I I my heart goes out to all the survivors here in South Africa that I know can't afford therapy and I would love to find a way of 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 finding a way of how we can get together and, and, and help one another heal because therapy is expensive. Yeah. And many of us, especially by virtue of having grown up there and, 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 and just by also by virtue of the, the absolute disparity between the rich and the poor here in South Africa, which isn't only in South Africa, there are so many people who are hurting so much and who can't afford therapy. So that that's something that I think will be the next big project I tackle is to find a way of bringing people together who can who can help. And I know people like Dr. Yanya Lalich and them they they have these incredible resources. Oh. But for South Africans, dollars are an obstacle. You know, our currency is really bad. But anyway, that that's just it's it's not, I haven't formulated it enough yet to even discuss it with. Dr. Lali or, or other people. I'm just kind of mouthing off here while talking to you. <laughs> well, I love it. And, and definitely conversation for the future because um, I've already had conversations with some others where, you know, I'd like to do something. Um, I don't know if it'll just have to be on my website, but I have honestly been asked um, or approached by people where they have kind of said to me, like, how can we help? And I think actually what they have through those words, I believe that some of those people are willing to actually kind of donate money. And I've really wow. thought about that, that I'd like to be able to have something together where some of my services, you know, can literally be free or extremely um, cheap yes. so that we can serve. And what I'd like to do is have some of these different categories um, where people can donate to very particular groups 
So like the Crusties of Bantu survivors, um, another area for me that I'd like to give people access for donating is around some resources for those who are escaping polygamy and literally yes. have no home, have no, you know, they need really basic, um, basic help initially. And so, so to be continued, Erica, for sure. Absolutely. I think in, in New Zealand, the, the Gloria Vale Leavers Trust seem to be an organization that, that I find quite aspirational. These are leavers from Gloria Vale. If you don't know about Gloria Vale, definitely look them up. They are so similar to Quasi Zavantu, but, um, and they, they have a Leavers Trust where, um, they actually actively work to helping people who leave, um, to set themselves up and, and they've been, um, going, legislating as well and i mean gloria vale is 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 in trouble now for using child labor um and that's that's in large part thanks to this organization so i can envision envisage starting something like that with fellow quasi Zabantu survivors yeah and then and then asking people to and and i mean i love your idea where if people are listening to your podcast and the quasi savanti story in particular moves them and they can then donate and and that can then be like translated into help for quasi savanti survivors i think that would be amazing yeah, yeah. but definitely a conversation to be continued yes, for sure definitely <laughs> And, and I suppose this is a great segue to just kind of wrap things up, Erica. Do you mind sharing with us a little bit about kind of what is happening present day with Christy Zabantu and sort of maybe also a little bit about what the kind of the activism that you've done and what's sort of come out and, and the kind of current state of affairs and what we hope might happen or if there's any way people can help. Yeah, so I'm going to go back to that me starting to realize in like around 1990, I left in 1993, so around 1996, I'm starting to realize that, hang on, what I experienced and what I witnessed, because we haven't really touched on the the worst of the abuses that they, that they did, but, you know, people can, can read about it. Um, that what I had witnessed and experienced was abuse. Um, it took me about three years. And then one day, I think it was 1997, I picked up a Cosmopolitan magazine. Now, we weren't allowed to have magazines or TVs or anything there. And I, I'm paging through this Cosmopolitan and suddenly there's fucking Dorothy Newlands in my face. Like she was the deputy principal when I was there and then became the principal. And it's a, it's a whole article about true love weights, which is a U.S. organization. Thank you very much, America. Oh. Um, that, that this lot then imported into it. South Africa and they were going around universities in particular, getting people to sign that they're not going to have sex before marriage and to pledge their virginity to God, you know. Oh, I did not and, realize this. How interesting. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then this was a, a balanced article by Cosmopolitan because then they also interviewed Dr. Marlene Wasserman, who here is known as Dr. Eve. And, and she was like, this is bullshit and why it is. I'm not going to go into all of it. But I read this and I was furious because they are using Cosmopolitan, which is a magazine that they um, decry as evil, to... Yes propagate and to proselytize and I was like fuck this so I sat down and I wrote Cosmo an enormously long letter I reproduced it in in its entirety in the book <laughs> um yeah I basically just go what the fuck actually <laughs> and then um that, oh, that was 1998 I think and then in um February 2000 Femina, which is another women's magazine, uh, they they ran a, a competition, a feature writing competition, where you could win some money and they would print your story. And I actually, well, I write about it in my book. I actually wrote my story in a few hours on the deadline day. I prevaricated for so long. I mean, that's what I do. I, I just put it off until the last minute and then I do it and sent it off and they published it. And 
that caused a bit of a storm in South Africa. And that's actually where my, the title of my book, Mission of Malice, comes from, because one of the Sunday papers... Um, that was their front page, Mission of Malice. I actually have that paper still. Um, and so, and 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 a number of journalists started investigating everything in Quest about to deny, 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 deny. And then the story kind of died around, uh, it took about a year to die and then it just fizzled out and died. And, and I was kind of like, I've done what I could, you know. I've told the world what goes on there. Um, I've kind of done what I could. And then fast forward to 2019 when um, Chris, someone who had left, contacted me and told me about my niece and that if she gets expelled, would I give her a home? And I'm like, yeah, do. Yeah. And now yeah. what happened in 2000 is there were a lot of people who had left Kwasi Sabantu, but who felt that I was harming God's work by bringing this into the secular media, that it should have been handled internally. And and I was like, screw that. God doesn't work where children are being beaten until they bleed. There is no way that that is God's work. And I was by this stage already also, I had lost my religion. And I'm no longer a Christian, but they were still Christians. And I, a lot of people supported me, but you know, as is normal, as you, you listen, you hear the people who, think you did the wrong thing and you don't hear the support. Yeah. And I basically broke ties with everybody from Kwasi Savanti, all the ex-members. I didn't have contact with them at all. For Well, some people found me on Facebook and we kind of became Facebook friends around 2015-ish or so, but and then 2019. And then I started getting involved again and um, – and uh, someone in the National Prosecuting Authority is feeling as frustrated with the lack of accountability and the lack of the prosecuting authority and the police investigating this place. And she said to one of us that you need to go to the media because if it's out in the media, they can't pretend it's not happening, right? So um, then they said to me, so Erica, well, because I've, I've I work in journalism. Well, I work I make magazines. Um, it's not not investigative journalism, or whatever. But I, I create magazines and I write and I edit. And I yeah. said, you're in the industry. You know, you do something. So I asked a friend, and he said, oh, you've got to speak to Adrian Basson, who is the head of News Twenty Four, which is South Africa's biggest news organization. I was like, dude, how am I going to get an audience with Adrian Basson? Like, you know, how, how? and he's like, ah, I'll email him. And so he emailed him and I ended up meeting with Adrian and Adrian actually wrote the foreword to my book. Um, oh, interesting. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he believed me. And I think, I think any survivor is going to know that, that to have someone believe you is huge. And uh, he, this place had been on his radar for a while and he then got a whole team together and they, they did a seven month investigation into this place. And they spoke to many of us. We had to give affidavits. And then on the 19th of September, 2020, so it's, yeah, two years, um, they they launched it. They launched it with a documentary and the podcast. And that's the podcast recordings I refer to in the passage you read. Yeah. And um, lots of articles. And that finally then spawned. So in South Africa, we have a body called the CRL Rights Commission. It's the Commission for the Protection of the Rights of Cultural, Linguistic, and Religious Communities in South Africa. Oh, they nice. are they're mandated by our constitution. You know, I'm so proud of South Africa. We have, I think, one of the best constitutions in the world. Like, we recognize the rights of everybody in, in practice. It doesn't always translate into practice, but we have a solid constitution. Anyway, so this is a constitutional body, and they decided to launch an investigation. Now they've been they've taken two years already, and nothing. So, if you follow me on Twitter, you will know that I'm very frustrated with these people for taking so long. So there are active investigations, but nothing has happened. And Kwasi Sabantu, they are extremely rich and very powerful. 
They own um, South Africa's largest water bottling plant. They export avocados to the UK and to Europe. Please don't stop buying South African avocados because there are many wonderful South African farmers that you would hurt. <laughs> so, don't. so in South Africa, I call for the boycott of Aquile water because that, but, but I do not call for the boycott of South African avocados because our avocados are delicious. But <laughs> Halls and Sons, Halls and Sons, who are the exporters and importers, they need to account for why they are still doing business with this place. Halls and Sons, I'll call them out. Yeah. Um, and so I call out the, so most of the retailers took this water off their shelves. Yeah. And then Kwasi Zavantu paid two lawyers to have an independent investigation. Right. <laughs> they paid. <laughs> and this independent investigation said, we are not qualified to tell you whether they are a cult or not, but they are not a cult. Oh, I have to read you this, oh this tweet because, um, oh, my God, it's so brilliant. So it's another Twitter user. <laughs> so he goes, so I write, I'm quite vocal about Kwasi Zabantu on Twitter, but the tweet of the year belongs to user at JG77. So here's his tweet. <laughs> okay. Regarding the <laughs> Regarding the cult allegation, the report seems to say that it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, but nonetheless concludes that it simply ain't a duck because those looking, walking, and quaking like ducks claim they are not ducks. <laughs> yeah. And so in by, by February 2021, like the water was back on all the shelves, they are aggressively pursuing big sporting events and, and sponsoring them. Wow. Sporting events always need sponsors. So we've got Aquile Tour Durban, a cycle race. We've got Aquile Midmar Mile, you know, and such, such a big fuck you to all of us who have, because literally you can Google Kwasi Zabantu and you will see how many people have by now spoken out about this place and what they endured. Um, there's one particular News 24 story, which is to be abused is one thing, to be abused by a, a, in the name of God is another, which details the abuse perpetrated by one man, Michael Ngubane. And Michael Ngubane is a director of Aquele, and he is still the head of the school board of Kwasi Sabantu, but he used to strip kids naked and beat them until they bled. And no accountability, no remorse, no nothing. You know, it's like you show me any other company – that is has a director who is a ch known child abuser, but none of the retail people. So I'm very vocal and I'm very vocal at calling people to account, but I'm just one woman, you know. I'm, I, 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 oh. um, so, and I wrote my book, and that's part of my activism, you, you know, to, to tell our story. It, it was for more than just that. I, I always knew I wanted to write a book, and I always thought I would publish it write it after my mother died um because as much as i dislike her i also don't want to cause her any harm you know right. yeah. and so i always had i knew my first like two sentences were they buried my mother today i wasn't there and that was how i was going to open my book yeah. but then events you know like my book needed to be written now and so i wrote it now <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very vocal and, and I, whichever media is willing to speak to me, especially here in South Africa, whichever media wants to speak to me, yeah. like I'm always willing, I'm happy to speak. Um, I just want to keep raising awareness, but yeah, the inaction of the South African authorities, I have no answer for that. I mean, even me, I, I got um, the most horrific death threat. Um, you know, when you when you get an SMS from a from a from a number that you don't know, and it tells you how they it's going to gut you like a fish and slice off your hands and slice off your feet and oh. rejoice when you burn in hell like Jezebel. You know, that's like fuck. Does this person know where I live? You know, like oh, ooh. Um, oh, so I went to the. Yeah, no, that was that was horrific. It, it it happened in October last year, and and I realized just recently how much I shrank. I've shrunk my life. I've been scared to leave my house. You know, I've I've really allowed that to really really shrink my world. And no more, no more. Um, you know, like 
if you're going to kill me, then you're going to kill me. But at least my book is written now and my book is there and, and my voice will never be silenced, even if, 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 if someone kills me. I don't think the threat came from Kwasi Zabantu itself. I did receive many horrible SMSs from people who were obviously at Kwasi Zabantu because they knew things about my family that any, but nobody else would know. Yeah. Um, but, um, so I went to the police with this death threat. I had the, the cell phone number. I had the time of day. And I thought that at least with the cell phone towers, they would be able to pinpoint the location because my suspicion is this is the idiot who is sitting in jail. Um, and uh, if I could prove that, then, then I mean, like maybe then he can sit in jail a little bit longer, you know? Yeah. And the, the detective, I got a message to say this detective has been assigned to your case. And then I heard nothing until I got an SMS from the South African Police Services a few months later to say the case has been closed um, because of a lack of leads. And I was like, really? Really? So, yeah. So, you know, South African authorities really don't give a fuck. Excuse the language. But it's very clear that they don't. And there's part of me that, that, that it irks me. Yeah. I mean, of course, it hurts me. It angers me, and I and I just wish, like, someone like the New York Times, or I don't know, I I, I wish that somebody with a little bit of or the Guardian um, in the UK. I mean, I reached out to the Guardian, and I I spoke to the one reporter, but I think maybe I spoke to the wrong journalist. I don't know. Um, I just wish somebody would bring some international scrutiny because yeah. I think South Africa might respond to international scrutiny because they sure as hell are not responding to internal south african scrutiny but um, so all i can do is is just keep at it but it does get exhausting and and it takes a toll you know it uh, it does take a toll and i can feel my body just every time i speak my whole body is just a ball of tension like my back is in a spasm now and I suppose, you know, I would have thought it would be easier already because this is two years um, that I've been speaking out so much. But every single time, it's still hard. But I, I, and my therapist and I talk about th the fact that I need to also have an identity outside of this fight. Yeah. And I know that. But like right now, it feels like this fight is all consuming. And I am working to have an identity outside of it as well. Yeah. But it kind of feels like for the next while at least that this is I, – I, I, I can't stop now, even though – I mean, I've built a beautiful life for myself here in Cape Town. I yeah. have an incredible friendship group. I have two cats that are just like my life. If you follow me on Instagram, <laughs> you will see a lot of cats. Um, so I have a beautiful life. I don't I – don't, I, I could just switch if I was able to, and I could just switch this off. I have such a stunning life to live. Yeah. Um, I think the challenge for me is to kind of try and live that life at the same time as, as, as doing this. And um, I'm not very good with getting that balance right at the moment, <laughs> but um, well, it's also, it, yeah. that's a discovery process, right? It's like, Sometimes there are other things going on in our lives where it's the season of feeling strong and sometimes it, we just feel a little weaker, you know, and like we've been talking about, it's, it's all good and it's all normal and we ride the waves of life, right? Yeah, and, tr and try to remain as authentic as possible in every moment, you know, answering to what yeah what's moving within you know and um you know my friend fell in pilo so she was at crisis of Ante as well and she was actually sent without a suitcase she was expelled and she had to leave with only the clothes on her back and not a single cent and when she was 15 years old they did that you know and after getting a severe beating because they would first beat you and then they'd kick you out um oh. But her and I have reconnected, and it's it's such a big gift. Jesse as well, the Jesse in my book, and Belen Pilo and and Monica, that they really are the three people that I've connect really connected with. Oh yeah, and there's some guys as well, like Greg and and people. But Belen Pilo, um, she will sometimes like phone me and say about that tweet, like 
really do you think yeah and then I'd be like no this is what I mm, mm." and she'd be yeah but but think about how it sounds and um and 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 could do you think you could maybe have expressed it in a slightly different way so I'm really grateful for Ted and Pilo because I get very fired up and then I like (laughs) and then then Ted and Pilo is my voice of reason that's like yeah, Erica. So I try to never delete tweets, but um, but every now and again, I mean, there are some tweets on my timeline that I think, yeah, I could have done a little better there. <laughs> and so, but Telemundo is just the most wonderful person. She came, she came um, and and spent Christmas and New Year, this most recent Christmas and New Year with me, and we just had such an incredible, I think, about six weeks together, where she came to visit, and we were just. It was just so wonderful, you know, and, and, and whenever, yeah, and I have also connected with some incredible people like you, for example, and then Casey from the Cult Vault has become a close friend and we oh, WhatsApp yeah. Oh, yeah, all the time. I think I think I think I think her as well. well. Yeah, and then oh, there's my friend Lauren Wolf. I mean, she's like an award-winning journalist that I we connected over Twitter and now we've actually become friends in real life. And the other night I had a full on, I think a full on panic attack. And my really good friend here in Cape Town was away and I didn't want to worry her. So I just, I hope Lauren won't mind, but I just sent Lauren a message saying I'm not doing well. And she immediately phoned me and Mm -hmm. she just talked me through breathing exercises. And she just helped me. What I was saying earlier about the worst has already passed and you've survived it. And, you know, um, she was just, and, and then, yeah, so I've met some incredible people through social media and, and through this activism work. And yeah, I think my life is very, very, very rich. So if it's, if I sounded a bit like, Oh, woe is me um, earlier, I don't, I don't really mean that. <laughs> I just need to find a better balance. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> not at all. And and again, I appreciate you sharing about that so openly because it's such a unique journey, you know, and I think again, for people to really just hear the real voice and the real experiences and the real feelings around it all, you know, it's, it's not just black and white, these things. So thank you so much, Erica. It has just been such a pleasure to be with you during this time, but also I I really treasure this connection and so appreciate I've gotten to know you. And thank you so much. I've loved our conversations leading up to this podcast and also this whole (laughs) podcast recording that we've done. And I look forward to just continuing this relationship with you, this friendship. It's really wonderful. And yeah, I appreciate you so much. And I do enjoy listening to your podcast. You know, you've got such a, a beautifully calm, but insightful way of of speaking to your guests and bringing your experience and your knowledge and and your empathy to the conversation is something really beautiful so just jumping in here to introduce this next section as a follow-up conversation that Erica and I had the last time we were just kind of revisiting would it be nice to just talk in retrospect a little bit about the moment of where there's the experience of, I don't know, how would you refer to that moment? Oh, yes, that, that, that's, that, um, that, that moment. Um, How would I refer to it? Especially now having watched it and listened to it again. Yeah. um, It just, I, I would, I would probably say emotional overwhelm. Yeah. Um, I, I felt a bit overwhelmed and I felt that, that because of these, um, neurogenic tremors, I knew that I was, I, I was, um, kind of in, I had, I had placed myself back in time, back in a trauma. I, I felt like I was kind of reliving some trauma. Yeah. Um, which doesn't happen to me usually so much in in conversation anymore. Sometimes it still happens in therapy when I get really deep with my therapist, but 
And I know it was because I was speaking about my nieces and and that that feeling of helplessness. So I think I think it was probably I would call it a, a moment of a moment of overwhelm, you know. Um and I have really learned that I have really learned this lesson that none of that is weakness. Um because for so many years I viewed my tears and my my tenderness as weakness and it so is not. And because I don't see it as weakness, there is no shame attached for me to breaking down and to being that vulnerable. And I mean, Brene Brown in her talks on vulnerability talks about you stepping into the arena. You know, you, yeah. it, it's like I feel that it's there's actually strength in sharing yourself at your most vulnerable with the world. And if that can lead to somebody having a realization for themselves or just a feeling of kinship, like I am not alone, yeah. then I'm actually so happy to share that moment of extreme emotional overwhelm yeah. with the world you know but I did in the moment I, I I needed to take several deep breaths and that doesn't translate that well into audio for podcasts which is why I needed you to stop the recording or I wanted you to stop the recording because I knew in order to just get back and center myself back in my body I needed to just do some some deep breathing and I, I didn't necessarily want that to to be recorded um but and that's the amazing thing of we we spoke about that community of people um who are doing incredible work um and you included in your podcast in your work of of bringing together people sharing stories helping heal we're helping each other heal we're helping one another heal and um and so today when i when i listened again to to that moment and i was like but but that is me that is that is who i am it's just so real so i feel our whole conversation in in both these episodes have been so real you know there's no pretense there's no and I I noticed towards the end I was also swearing a fair amount so apologies <laughs> to everyone who's triggered by the word fuck because I said it a number of times well, I'll, I'll be sure to press the explicit option for the podcast Apple Apple category. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, yeah, and and that um, that that moment with you in that in that when we recorded the podcast led me to also discuss it with my therapist in therapy because honestly I I wouldn't be where I am today without therapy. I am such a huge believer in therapy. Um and realizing actually the the strength that there is in our vulnerability and the and the and and that it's okay. You know, I I'm so scared of asking for help. Well, not that I'm scared of it. I just don't ask for help. I don't reach out my hand and say, hey, I'm having a little bit of our time. You know, can how are you doing? Like, can we hang out? I tend to go completely quiet. My friends, I think, kind of I know by now when they don't hear from me for weeks, there's yeah. a problem. 
you know, Erica's struggling. Because when I'm not struggling, then then they hear from me all the time. But when I'm struggling, I go quiet. Yeah. And that was just for me a a reminder that it's okay. I don't have to be all bubbly and happy when I see my friends. It's okay to sometimes just say, I'm struggling and and just share that 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 I'm feeling overwhelmed and I'm struggling and and this is all a little bit much right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, certainly for me, Erica, that moment also just felt like, um, honestly, it felt like this might sound like a weird way to put it, but it felt like a gift to me to be able to just be with you in that moment. And then, you know, our little break offline and really it's like, um, it's like that thing about vulnerability and being with somebody in it. It's so rare that we get to be with one another in these kind of sensitive and vulnerable moments. And so it does feel like a gift. And I think why I use that is I think because there's an element of, um, maybe choice in it, right? That one, like some part of you made a choice to allow me to be with you in that moment. Like we could have stopped everything or gotten off or, you know, and so I think also that felt, I think that's what sort of changed me is feeling your willingness to be with me and allow me to feel close with you. Mm. And then I think that probably just is part of like, there's something about that that I feel like has become part of the fabric of our connection. Yes, very much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's that, yeah, and 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 the excitement I feel now whenever your name pops up on my phone, I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, um, you know, but isn't isn't that so true? It is when we are vulnerable with each other that we share all of ourselves. Yeah. You know, so, and you embraced that whole being that I was showing you. You, you embraced it so carefully and tenderly. And I felt so supported and, and held. Um, but you can't, you can't then go back to just superficial stuff, <laughs> you know, it, 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 there's a deepening of a connection. And, yeah. And that was between us, but, but, but in a way also then between us and your listeners, yeah. um, by allowing them to witness some of that. Um, um, because I think you can hear in my voice that I'm, that I'm highly emotional. Uh, you know, you, you can, you can hear it. And then, and then later in the conversation, my voice lightens up again and, and, and I'm laughing again. And, and yeah, yeah. I, I don't regret, I don't, I don't regret it at all. Not, not one, not one single bit, you know. Well, and um, I think that's the gift of, of, you you sharing this and I think part of the desire for us to kind of come back together and discuss this to possibly share with the audience because it really is that thing I think for so many of us that we're also in environments of high demand where like perfection is held as the pinnacle of what we're all striving for it's like it is just so refreshing now to be human isn't it just it is so refreshing and it is so refreshing to be all of me and to, to when I'm, when, when I'm emotional and I want to cry, then, then, then I'm emotional and I cry. Um, and when I am laughing, then I laugh, you know, I can, I can, I can, 
I can experience the various emotions and what I'm feeling without needing to tamp down on it because it's too much or wrong or but that I that perfection ideal like who says what is perfect anyway perhaps I for, for me I am the perfect example of who I am and who I should be and who I am is someone who is very in touch with my emotions (laughs) so like is this is it a stepford wife you know like is it this very contained person who doesn't who always smiles and who doesn't allow a ripple of unease anywhere but that is not being human right being human is messy right (laughs) <laughs> right. And that's why I think it's like we, as humans already in our journey of life, we tend to carry so much shame anyway about things. And so I think in the freedom of being human, there's just this uh, like removal, like you said, an acceptance and a curiosity of like, who is the fullness of this human? What does that look like? You know? Yeah. And yeah. and I think also we're these amazing creatures where we have we we sense what's right for us and what isn't right for us. It's like a system of contained like measurements of balance all the time, right? So it's like if we have feelings that we actually don't like to have, there's an exploration there. And you know, there are things that tip us off to behavioral changes that are needed, right? Like we were talking about for myself and feeling kind of overwhelmed. It's like, yeah. oh, it's a really good gauge when I feel badly that I haven't called my auntie who had an accident and it's a tip off for me. I'm in overwhelm that I haven't made that phone call. Mm. And that doesn't yeah. feel good. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah you know, that the overwhelm needs to come into more balance. Yeah, absolutely. 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 And I need solitude um, to yeah. to thrive. I definitely need solitude, but I get a lot of solitude because I live on my own. So, um, you know, I, I, I have solitude in abundance. Uh, I need to just make the most of it and not always have something on, you know, the go, but to be in that solitude. Um, but it's, I, I'm a social creature, like like all of us are. And it's kind of unfair to the people in my life to only show them my happy side, isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of unfair. And it's, it's not allowing them to see all of me. Yeah. And, and I've only recently come to realize that, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm dating at the moment and I I met a guy I really like. Um who yeah. knows what's going to happen whether anything is going to come of it or not it might not but I can see sometimes that he's like quite taken aback at just how very open and honest and vulnerable I am. Yeah. And I don't I've learned not to tamper that down and if it's too much for someone well then it's too much but so far it hasn't proved to be too much for anyone you know yes people respond positively when you share yourself I think in general but then I am and I'm the world's biggest Pollyanna you know I (laughs) I silver linings I believe humans are actually wonderful things and we're all actually good and except for the few bad apples and you know so I have this despite my background I have these rose tinted lenses that I look at people and work through you know um (laughs) yeah so I do I do I do think very highly of humans in general um which is weird considering what they did to me what some humans did to me but I know well it it's it's pretty amazing actually I mean I feel like that is where there are elements of like this sort of uh, kernel of core things that we are that sort of journey through life with us. And so it's beautiful that that has not been taken, you know? Yeah. 
Absolutely. We so hope that you enjoyed this episode. And please stay tuned for part of Leaving the Cult, the season two song written by Jaya Suri. And for all things related to Jaya, her music, ways that you can support her, check out the show notes.